Welcome to our video series on genetics. This is part one, Mendelian genetics. This video has a ton of information, so it will be important for you to stop and take notes as we go through. In the mid-1850s, an Austrian monk named Gregor Mendel made a series of observations and inferences regarding the basis of inheritance of physical traits. With a background in mathematics and a penchant for gardening, Mendel meticulously studied over 30,000 individual pea plants over a seven-year period. Makes you wonder what else there was to do as a 19th century monk. These observations became the basis for how we understand modern genetics and accurately predicted the presence and mechanism of transfer of genes long before the physical nature of DNA had been determined. Before we look at Mendel's work, let's consider what was known at the time. It was known that offspring tend to look like their parents and that siblings look alike. Wait. Wait, no. That's not right. Sorry about that. It was also known that selective breeding can shape the look and qualities in livestock and other agricultural products. Sexual reproduction was understood in that there must be a combining of gametes to ensure the next generation, but the underlying mechanism was not known. Remember, while you may understand meiosis as the process to produce gametes and DNA as the physical carrier of the genetic code, people of Mendel's time did not have direct knowledge of the cellular and chemical processes involved, and that's what makes Mendel's work so impressive. Mendel was studying pea plants that produce flowers with both male and female reproductive structures, so self-fertilization is possible. Mendel was able to cross-pollinate specific plants and observe the traits of the resulting offspring and compare them to the traits of the parent. Mendel observed that he had a field of plants where the peas grew tall and another plot where the pea plants grew short. If he bred one of these tall plants with another tall plant, all the offspring that resulted were tall. And if he bred one of these short plants with another of these short plants, all the offspring were short. He called these pure breeding lines. So what happens when we make a hybrid? When we cross one of these pure breeding tall plants with one of these pure breeding short plants? We'll call this the P1 generation, or the parent generation. What do you hypothesize would be the results? Well, many of you already know how this story goes, but it would not be unreasonable to hypothesize that all the resulting plants would be medium in height. In fact, that's a very logical conclusion. However, every time Mendel made this cross between a pure breeding tall plant and a pure breeding short plant, all the resulting plants were tall. 100% of the time, no exceptions. We call these plants the F1 generation. It was as if the shortness version of the trait was gone. But here's the interesting thing. What happens if he takes two of these tall offspring plants, two of these F1 generation hybrids and cross them with each other. Now remember, both of these plants are tall, and previously when we cross tall with tall, we only produce tall, and when we cross, cross tall with short, we only produce tall. So now again, crossing two tall plants, we would logically hypothesize what? All tall, right? It makes sense. However, this is not what happened. In fact, from this cross of two hybrid tall plants, we produced both tall and short plants. The shortness factor hadn't gone away, it had just been hidden. But the most important part of this observation by Mendel was that the ratio of the tall to short plants in this F2 generation was always 3 to 1. 75% of the plants were tall and 25% of the plants were short every time. To a mathematician like Mendel, this was no accident. This was not due to chance. These results led Mendel to make a few inferences. 1. Traits or characteristics are being controlled by distinct factors. We'll call them genes. 2. For each trait, a person carries two of these factors, one inherited from each parent. 3. These factors come in alternate forms that we'll call alleles. 4. When opposing alleles are inherited together, only one is expressed, the dominant allele. The other allele is said to be recessive. We'll call this the law of dominance. And finally, five, while an individual carries two factors for each trait, they can only pass one along to their offspring. We call this the law of segregation. In our example, the characteristic, the trait, in this case height, was not being controlled by one factor, but instead two. If it was controlled by only one, then how could shortness go away and then return? 
So an individual receives two factors from each trait, one from each parent. And those factors came in two forms, tall and short, and one dominated the other. In this case, the tall was the dominant trait and was expressed when both were present at the same time. Now let's summarize as we define some useful terms. Genes are distinct units, hereditary units, specific portions of DNA that determine characteristics of the organism. Alternate forms of each gene are called alleles. Each trait is determined by two alleles, one from each parent. Often one allele is dominant over the other. Using this information, let's revisit these pea plants and look at them in a different way. We will use letters to represent the different alleles of our trait. So our trait is height. One rule we need to follow is to use one letter for each trait. Convention holds that we usually pick the first letter of the dominant trait. So in our example, we'll use T to represent height. But this height gene comes in two forms, tall and short. Again, it's convention that we assign the dominant allele, the capital version of this letter, and the recessive version of the allele, the lowercase letter, T. So our original parent plants can be represented by two letter combinations, big T, big T for the tall plant, and little t, little t for the short plant. This two letter combination that represents the alleles present is called the genotype. We can describe these two genotypes, big T, big T, and little t, little t, with descriptive terms, homozygous dominant, and homozygous recessive. And then we talk about the genetic uh, expression, what we see when we look at the plant, otherwise known as the phenotype. In this case, we would see a tall plant, and in this case, we'd see a short plant. Now we can show the cross in what we call Punnett square. We can take this parent's gametes and put them along this side, and this parent's gametes we can put along this side, and then we see what happens when we combine them. We can see that all of the F1 generation, 100% of the F1, will have big T, little t genotype. We describe this genotype as heterozygous. And based on the law of dominance, we know that plants with this genotype will have the tall phenotype. So we can go back and finish this chart. Big T, little t genotype we describe as heterozygous, and we'll have the, because of the law of dominance, we'll have the same phenotype as homozygous dominant. They will look tall. Now on to our second generation cross. If we take these two offspring and we cross them, these two F1 hybrids, using our Punnett square, we show how each parent can give half its genetic material. These T's here and these T's here. This is called a monohybrid cross. And when we recombine the gametes, we should get these results for our F2 generation. We can look at these results in terms of genotypic results and phenotypic results. In one of our boxes, we get big T, big T genotype. In two of our boxes, we get a heterozygous genotype. And in our fourth box, we get homozygous recessive genotype in a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio. For our phenotypic results, we can see that in three of our boxes, we have tall plants. And in one of our boxes, we have a short plant. We can now clearly see why Mendel always produce a 3 to 1 phenotypic ratio with this series of crosses. So far we've only looked at one trait, but if we look at two traits at the same time, we learn another really important piece of information. So let's consider height and color. In peas, green color is dominant to yellow color. So our keys would look like this. Let's show a cross between a pea plant that's homozygous dominant for both height and color and a pea plant that is short and yellow. Stop the video and write the genotypes for each parent plant. Remember, we are describing two traits, so our genotype must have four letters in it. Let's see if you came up with the correct genotypes for these parent plants. A plant that's homozygous for height will have two big T's, and homozygous for color, two big G's. And if a pea plant is short, it must have two little t's, and if it's yellow, two little g's. So here are our parents. Due to the law of segregation, each parent can only give half of its information. But which half? This half? How about this half? The law of segregation says we have to give one of each type of factor. So each parent can only give one t and one g. So this is what we get. Now let's put them back together. 
we can see that all four boxes are going to be identical, so we don't need all four boxes. We can just make this into to one box here. Whoops, I lost a G. There we go. So we put this together, we can do this. But that's actually a mess. We don't want to do it this way. When we put this back together, we want to put the T's next to the T's and the G's next to the G's. That's better. It's easier to read. So our F1 generation is all the same. The genotypic result is 100% heterozygous for both traits. We can call this a dihybrid. And the phenotypic result is what it looks like. They'll all be tall and green. Now let's perform a dihybrid cross to see what happens. We take two of the F1 hybrids and we cross them. Okay, we start by segregating our T's from each other and segregating our G's from each other based on the principle of segregation. Now we reach a very interesting point. Just because I give the dominant height gene, do I have to get the dominant color gene? Or could I switch them? The principle of independent assortment says that the segregation of one gene pair, the T's, is an independent event from the segregation of another gene pair, the G's, as long as they're on separate chromosomes. In other words, as long as they're not linked. So do the dominant green pods go with the dominant tall gene? And does the recessive yellow gene go with the recessive height gene? It turns out they are not tied together. Mendel performed thousands of crosses looking at two traits at the same time, and it led him to describe this principle of independent assortment. What this means is that we can make each of these four possible gametes. Now we're ready to set up our Punnett square. The principle of segregation says we have to segregate our T's from each other and segregate our G's from each other. And the principle of independent assortment shows that we can also make these two combinations. We get the same gametes across the top, and now we recombine to see what our possible offspring are. Stop the video here and fill out your own Punnett square. Okay, now let's see how you did. I'm just filling in mine here, and you can compare it with your own and see how you did. The next step is to record our result. The next step is to record our results. First, the genotypic results. We have to write down every possible genotype that shows up in our Punnett square. And it turns out there are nine different genotypes, and we need to figure out how many times each of these shows up. So we'll mark them as we go. We have one of these, and two of these guys, and let's see, two of these guys, and one of these, and four four, I believe four of these guys, so let's see if these to come up, yep, four of these, and two of these, and one of these, two of these, and finally one of these. So we get this genotypic ratio of one to two to one, to two to four to two, to one to two to one. But you'll seldom be asked to do this, more likely you'll be asked to do the phenotypic results. So let's do that. First, we have to write down all the different phenotypic possibilities. These plants can be tall and green, tall and yellow, short and green, and short and yellow. Again, I'll mark them as I go. I have tall and green, 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 four, nine. I have tall and yellow, tall and yellow, tall and yellow for three, short and green, short and green, short and green three, and only one that is short and yellow. We see that for a dihybrid cross, we get a phenotypic ratio of nine to three to three to one. So that's gonna do it for our first video in this series, The Basics of Mendelian Genetics. In the next three videos, we'll talk about some of the variations on Mendel's themes and specifics on human chromosomes and human genetics. I hope you learned something. If you have any questions, leave them in the comment sections below and somebody will answer them.